Welcome to the Sound School video series, where I am going to tell you everything you need to know about audio production. My name is Rena, and I have worked in sound for more than 20 years. I've worked in recording studios as well as live sound. I've done front of house mixing for concerts. I have done system teching for large venues. I've done monitors for all kinds of different bands. And lately I've been doing a ton of mixing and mastering at my recording studio in Montreal. So I'm putting together the video series that I wish I would have found when I was first learning how to do audio engineering. I'm gonna give you all the basics of everything you need to know to get started. And once we get all that figured out, I'm gonna give you some more challenging concepts and some exciting tips and tricks. A lot of the stuff I'm telling you is stuff that I wish everyone who did sound knew all about. Sound engineering is a funny business because anybody with good ears and a talent for listening can start working right away. You don't need a degree for somebody to hire you to mix their record, you just have to do a good job of it. So a lot of people get really far in the business without really knowing exactly what they're doing. So the stuff I'm gonna teach in these courses is the stuff that I wish everyone who does sound knew. It's all the basics for you to build on and get better and better at your work. Hi, welcome back to Sound School. This is the first lesson in audio engineering, the basics of sound. In order to effectively manipulate sound as audio technicians, we need to comfortably understand how sound is created and how it functions physically. So what is sound? Well, sound occurs when physical events cause air pressure changes that our ears pick up. Our ears are capable of sensing very small pressure changes tiny fluctuations that we perceive as distinct, recognizable sounds. So a sound event is a physical action that creates enough of a pressure change to be observed by our ears. A really obvious sound event that we can use right now as an example is a hand clap. You can probably imagine how that creates a change in air pressure. So let's take a closer look at what's happening after that sound event. So these are air molecules at rest. They're not totally motionless, particles are always active, but they're not in enough motion for any changes to be perceived by our ears. Something has to make them move enough that our eardrum notices. Now let's think about our sound event. It strikes, and the force from the event pushes the molecules together, or compresses them. You get a group of molecules pushed together, and then as those push together, behind them comes a group of molecules that get pulled apart as the wave moves through the air. So you have to visualize this wave of pressure as spherical, outward from the event. Also, recognize that this wave will lose intensity as it passes through space and time. This repeated wave of high and low pressure can be really easily charted on paper as a sine wave. The sine wave shows the peaks, which are the waves of high pressure or compression when the molecules get pushed together. And it also shows the valleys, which are the waves of low pressure or rarefaction when the molecules get pushed apart. We can then draw a line through the sine wave at the point where there's no pressure change to represent the particles at rest. Now we can refer to the period of compression as positive pressure above the line and the period of rarefaction as negative pressure below the line. The negative pressure zone will always be equal and opposite to the positive pressure zone as the molecules pull apart while the wave moves through the air. So now we understand how perceivable sound is created and how that relates to the idea of a waveform. Now let's look at the seven characteristics of a waveform. Waveforms, or sound pressure waves, have different characteristics depending upon the sound event that created them. These characteristics are what allow us to tell an infinite number of different sounds apart from each other. So these seven factors that determine how we tell different sounds apart from each other are amplitude, frequency, velocity, wavelength, phase, harmonic content, and envelope. The first one and easiest to understand is amplitude. Amplitude is determined by the intensity of the pressure or the amount of air pressure being created by our sound event. It's indicated on our waveform graph by the distance above and below the center line. 
the greater the pressure displacement, the higher the waveform on the graph. You can probably already guess that this determines the perceived loudness. More pressure means more of an impact on our eardrums, sounds louder. Less pressure, less of an impact, quieter. Amplitude is measured in decibels. The second really obvious characteristic of a waveform is frequency, which is the rate at which a pressure wave repeats over time. So you know, a sound event happens and the waves push outward and they repeat and repeat and repeat as they dissipate through the air. The frequency just means the speed at which the sound source is vibrating to create the pressure displacement. And then we perceive different vibration speeds as differences in pitch. So one complete excursion of a wave, or one completed period of positive and negative pressure, is called a cycle. The number of complete cycles that occur in one second determines the frequency and is measured in hertz. That's H-E-R-T-Z, hertz. So the frequency determines the pitch that we perceive. Faster vibration means shorter cycles and a higher perceived pitch. Slower vibration means longer cycles and a lower perceived pitch. The third characteristic of waveforms is velocity, which just means the speed of sound, which is pretty clearly defined by the laws of physics. Sound travels at 1130 feet per second or 334 meters per second. But it only travels that speed at sea level at about 68 degrees Fahrenheit. How fast sound travels is temperature and atmospheric dependent. Because of course, temperature and atmospheric pressure is going to change how far apart the molecules are already, which will then mean they'll either travel faster together or take longer to push together after a sound event. So for every degree Celsius rise in temperature, the speed increases by two feet per second. And then the higher elevation we get up from sea level, the speed of sound reduces because the air is less dense. So therefore more energy is required to generate a pressure displacement, which also means when you get up far enough, there's no sound in outer space. There's no air, there's no air pressure. Of course, sound also travels through substances other than air, and so, Based on our observations of how sound travels through air, we can assume that in denser mediums, it would travel faster. So in the air, we're traveling at 1130 feet per second. So water, for example, is a more dense substance than air. Of course, sound travels faster through water than air. In seawater specifically, which is more dense than fresh water because of all the salt, sound travels at 4900 feet per second. And then if we get even more dense and look at something like wood, it'll go even faster through it. Of course, woods come in different densities, hardwood, softwood, but fur, for example, on average, sound travels through that at 12,500 feet per second. And then we get even denser into stuff like metal. And in steel, for example, the speed of sound is 16,600 feet per second. Why do we care? All this stuff that we work with, instruments, audio equipment, the rooms that we work in, it's all made out of different substances. If you're building a guitar, you're gonna care about what kind of wood resonates at what kind of frequencies, and that's always going to be determined by its density. And then we definitely care about the speed of sound at large events and concerts, because if you're far away at a festival, it's gonna take the sound from the sound system way longer to reach you than it is to reach your friend at the front of the stage. So it's always worthwhile to keep in mind how fast sound might be traveling in any given environment. The fourth characteristic of a waveform is wavelength, which is the physical distance required for a pressure wave to complete one full cycle, or literally the length of one sound wave. It's calculated with the equation wavelength equals velocity over frequency. So our wavelength in either feet or meters equals the speed or velocity of sound in either feet per second or meters per second divided by the frequency in hertz. So if we're at sea level and it's 68 degrees, that means sound is going at 1130 feet per second. And let's say we hear the pitch 440 hertz. 440 hertz is a good example because this is called concert A, or it's the frequency that orchestras will tune their instruments to. 
So 1130 feet per second is our velocity, divided by 440 hertz, which is our frequency, equals 2.56 feet. So 2.56 feet is the physical size of the pressure wave created by 440 hertz in the air. That's pretty cool. But so far, everything we have talked about only describes simple waveforms, or single perfect tones. Most of the sounds around us are a whole lot more complicated than that. So the next group of characteristics that we're going to talk about will help to describe the differences between more complex sounds. Waveform characteristic number five, phase. The phase of a waveform is the point at which it is measured or observed in its cycle. So this is maybe a little complicated to understand for the first time. But when a sound wave hits our ears, it's not necessarily hitting right at the exact moment of total pressure, no pressure, or total negative pressure. It's probably landing somewhere in between in its vibrational cycle. The point that it arrives is the point in its phase. Phase is measured in degrees. And it's important to understand because it determines the way that pressure from various sound events interact in the air and also how they interact within audio equipment once they become electronic signal, which would happen after they were picked up by a microphone, for example. So we have one waveform on our graph. It looks like this. If we were to add a second identical waveform at the same point in its cycle, the result would be double the amplitude or twice as loud. And this is called in phase. The two waveforms are perfectly in line with each other. They are in phase. And the pressure they create is twice as much. But then in turn, if we have two waves, but this time they're at opposite points in their phase. For example, if one of the events is delayed in time by exactly half of a cycle, then the combination results in no pressure, therefore no sound. This is called being out of phase. When two identical sounds are perfectly out of phase, they totally cancel and create silence. No more pressure. This combining of waves at different points in their cycles will result in a variance of combined pressure, anywhere from doubled to total cancellation and all the values in between. The degree to which waveforms are either in or out of phase with each other is called coherence or correlation, which just describes the amount of cancellation or addition caused by the relationship between two or more waveforms. Waveform characteristic number six, harmonic content. This term describes the way that multiple waves combine in various ways to create specific sound. Let's look at a relatively simple complex sound, a piano note. Each key makes its sound from a wooden hammer striking steel strings. The resulting sound is a very nearly perfect sine wave tone. Yet if we listen to a perfect sine wave from a tone generator and compare it to a piano note, our brain knows the difference. So this difference is created by the harmonic content that exists within a piano note that is not present in the signal from a tone generator. So where does this additional content come from? Well, the characteristics of the materials that the piano is made out of will add their own overtones and undertones. The hammer is wood, the strings are steel, the body of the piano is wood. We discussed the speed of sound through wood and steel, so we can assume that the densities of these materials will affect the sound passing through them in different ways, and now we also know that it will affect the phase correlation of the sounds, as it takes different amounts of time for the vibration to pass through each substance. As well, the resonant space inside the piano allows the sound to bounce around in there, creating waves that interact at different times physically in the chamber, which of course affects the amplitude of certain frequencies at certain times. These elements all come together to create distinct sounds. Now you can really imagine the effects that the design and construction of different instruments will have on their sounds. An acoustic guitar with a resonant body, a space that's bouncing frequencies around and having them interact within their phase, an electric guitar, made of wood, but instead of resonating within an open chamber, the wood resonates within itself and into an electronic pickup. A saxophone, made of metal, bouncing air around inside of it. 
and letting it out with its particular phase characteristics. You can go on and on and on looking at different instruments and thinking about how they create the sounds that we hear from them. So the complex harmonic content can be broken down and described by some simple terms. The fundamental frequency is the primary tone of the sound. For example, if someone is playing an A note, the primary tone is an A. If it's concert A, that's 440 hertz. Then we have the partials, or the overtones and undertones, which are higher frequencies that are observable within a sound, overtones, or lower frequencies that are observable, undertones. And then we have the specific harmonics. A harmonic is an overtone or an undertone that is a whole number multiple of the fundamental frequency. For example, a double in the frequency of a sound results in what we perceive as an octave difference. Double the frequency is an octave up, and half the frequency is an octave down. The seventh characteristic of waveforms describes the shape of a complex waveform by breaking it down into simple terms. So now we can look at a more complex waveform on the graph. So let's say we have a sound event in simple terms. The attack, the decay, the sustain, and the release. The attack is the time from the inception of a sound event to it reaching its highest amplitude, or the buildup of the sound to its highest level after the initial striking. If we think about the example of a snare drum, the attack is really fast. The time it takes to reach its peak is almost instantaneous. But if you compare that to, say, a timpani drum, the time is slower and a little more gentle in comparison. Next we have the decay, which is the time between the initial attack reaching its peak and the sustain. The sustain is the held segment of the sound. The time the sound is held for, or the primary resonant portion, which is followed by the release section, which is the time it takes for the sound to disappear after the sustain is completed. So if we think about this in terms of a single piano note, we have the attack when we strike the key. The attack is the time it takes to reach its full force. We have the decay, which is the time it takes for it to reach the full resonance of the instrument. The sustain, which holds on until we let go and the release, which is the time it takes for it to disappear from within the body of the piano. Envelope characteristics are specifically what we use electronically to manipulate different sounds within synthesis. Creating electronic instruments that mimic acoustic instruments is all done by manipulating these parameters, the attack, the decay, the sustain, and the release. Setting these four things up in different time configurations can make electronic synthesized sounds seem a lot like the real thing. Or manipulating these parameters can allow you to make really unique synthesized sounds. And now you understand all the characteristics of sound waves.